You're watching HuffPost Live, I'm Caitlin Becker. She grew up singing gospel music and years later she's a Grammy Award winning singer-songwriter with a successful solo career after being part of one of the best-selling female groups of all time, Destiny's Child. Now Michelle Williams is taking her talent full circle and helping revitalize failing choirs in the new Oxygen show, Fix My Choir. Let's take a look. I really love you. Did you singing? Because you first love me. I don't know what that was. <laughs> Me. I'm touching you. Uh, I can't breathe. Give me a second. Like we got some work to do. Uh, don't, don't get off key. Stay on key. We're coming to fix your choir. Three, two, one. Let's go. Now, like, up. Take charge like this. And Michelle Williams is here to tell us more. Welcome. Thank you. So, thank you for having me. Thank you for <laughs> joining us. This the show is so much fun. Obviously, everyone yes. is a huge Sister yes. Act fan, so we've been kind of waiting for someone to swoop in and save the real life choirs. Oh yes, yes. So talk to me about actually how it works. So you guys just surprise them. Well, um, we're called in um, for choirs who submitted their issues, and they were picked. And we go in and we have five days. So the first day we go in, they do not know. Though, but honestly, they don't know who's coming to fix the choir. All they know is we got a Grammy Award winning singer and a gospel singer were coming. That's all they knew, but they didn't know who it was going to be. So those were genuine reactions that you saw. So then now that we got all that out the way, it's like, no, don't look at me as that. I come here to serve and mentor you and we come to help you know, get you through your problems. Five days? Only five days. So trust me, some needed more than that. And then some, five days was enough, but some needed five years. <laughs> How did you actually get involved in the project? I got involved um, in, in or about January, February of this year. I was approached with the idea of Fix My Choir. Um, and I, I immediately said yes, because that's my background from growing up in church. I was a choir director. Um, and I would teach and lead songs in the choir. So. You really are going back to your to your roots, to like where going, you became yeah. a singer. It's still in me. It's still in me. The reactions of the actual choirs when they see you come in, mm -hmm. it, it's emotional to watch. Has there is, has everyone reacted like that? Is was there one person I saw? There was a little girl here who looked oh, super precious. That little girl was so sweet. She's in um, the second episode from the L.A. Inner City Youth Choir. And um, her energy, I was like, she's a star. It's like, I just wanted to take her and sign her up somewhere. She's gorgeous. She's great, great, great kid. So what are some of the biggest problems that the choirs are facing when you get in that, they, that, that you think sort of across the board everyone needed to work on? Well, it was amazing because the choirs, which they were great vocally, they just lacked respect for one another, respect for their leaders. And then there was one choir we worked with in Santa Barbara called Mama Pat's. It's a choir where if you can just breathe, come and join us. You don't even know how to sing. They had some of the most gracious hearts. Like, I just wanted to go to their house and make blueberry muffins and <laughs> talk. You know, they were so sweet. They soaked everything in. They just wanted to have more confidence. That's all they desired. And some of them just needed that, that assurance or that, it's like they needed permission to let go. And we were able to give them that. Is it harder to teach people or to coach people how to sing if they don't have that sort of innate, natural, raw talent? Or is it harder to sort of coach their personalities to work as a group? Well, it's both because one choir that's here out of New York called Sirens of Gotham, they're an acapella barbershop style choir. Technically amazing, but they really kind of lacked soul. It was kind of like almost robotic. Um, and then you have some that just could not sing at all, and you're like, maybe you should just be the secretary of the choir. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we always try to make sure we found a spot where they could feel like they belong, whether or not they didn't feel like they were as talented as the person next to them. You're here for a reason, you have a purpose, so we wanted to always encourage them that, you know, there's still a place for you. 
How do you tell someone that they're not a great singer if they think that they're singing like you out there? Well, what you would, I would just do is say, um, have you ever had a vocal coach? You're so talented, or I love your vibrato, so but you could work on maybe um, if you want to be able to hit higher notes. I would say things, something great like that, and then the vocal coach could then really assess and really do the nitty gritty. But now if you were just absolutely no potential whatsoever, I would say, are you in college? I, oh, you have healing in your hands. You probably could be a great physician. You know, you're, you're encouraging them, you're paying them compliments, but you're still telling them the truth. You, you probably shouldn't be in this area. <laughs> telling them you're really great at other things. Yeah. Get out, yeah. get out of the choir. Yeah. Because I would want someone to tell it like Has that. Has anyone ever given you sort of that harsh criticism? Well, growing up, um, my church had a drill team. And you have to, you know, do all this hand feet coordination. And I wasn't very good. And they told me, why don't you just be the flag bearer? And when I tell you I held that flag with so much pride and dignity. It didn't hurt your feelings? It didn't hurt my feelings, no. I kind of didn't really want to be in it anyway. And that's the other thing. When you're passionate about something, you'll do what it is that you need to do to, to perfect it. But if you have no passion for it, don't do it and don't waste your time and don't waste other people's time. But I just thought all my friends were doing it and they got to wear the cute short skirts and the cool t-shirts and the cool boots. I was like, I wanted to be like them, but that's not really what I was passionate about. So hmm, hence I would hold the flag. But you held that flag hmm. like a champ. Held that flag like a champ and then really ended up in a group where dancing was a requirement. Destiny's you know, Child was a major group of dancers. A major group of dancers. Now, you know, I was in the creative and performing arts growing up in Rockford, Illinois, um, in, the, in this called Kappa. So we, I took dance from like six, seven years classical. So it's not that, I just didn't think I needed it. I was going to school for criminal justice and minoring in sociology. I don't need to know ballet for that. <laughs> uh, quite the change though. Yeah. With, between criminal justice, sociology, and, yeah, and being singing. a star. You know what, I just didn't, I just was like, you know, I come from a small town, no one's gonna pick me up or anything, so it was all just that plan B, just to, but I always wanted to sing, I would, and I made these business cards, you know, I'll sing at your funeral, your bar mitzvah, weddings, parties. When did you change your mind? Uh, my second year, the last semester of college, I was absolutely miserable. It was just kind of like my spirit was telling me, I want you to do something else, you know. What did your family say when you told them that? I can't imagine that conversation you know, could always go over, well, I'm on this great track, I've got this yeah. great career in front of me, it makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense, I'm leaving, I want to I wanna go sing, I want to be a star. My family is fortunate to have three doctors in the family. My mom's a nurse, so obviously there's a lot of education um, that is encouraged in the family. So how I got out of it, because my first tour I was singing background for Monica, and I told my mom, I said, Mom, I'm gonna save up a bunch of money, because back then she liked the Chrysler 300M. So I'm gonna save up a bunch of money and I'm gonna get you that car. And she was like, and that right, mom with a car. And the next year, she got an Escalade in a house. So it, it, my life just changed like that. So she's, she's not too upset that I didn't finish college. But to be honest with you, I find myself going online, looking at online schools because a part of me is like, I wonder should I finish? Do you think? What do you think you would major in? Do you think the same back thing. The same thing. I would still do criminal justice. That's, I feel like that's a great thing to just sort of check off your bucket list. Yeah, I think I would. I would do it. I still love um, all the shows on television that deals with forensics and solving crime. I actually like watching real time trials on television. I get into it, you know. So um, I know that's a far cry from fix my choir, but it is I, a far that, cry. That's still law is still another passion of mine.
I uh, choirs. In law. Really? I majored, in it. I majored in broadcasting, but I minored in it. Just there's something fascinating about getting into the minds of someone you don't really the understand. The minds of, I saw the movie Kiss the Girls, and that's when it snapped for me. That's what I want to do. I want to get into the minds of people and why they do and why they, especially if it's a real colorful tragedy, what made them do it like right that? It's funny, I think the, the sort of statistical breakdown for it is women tend to really like that psychological sort of forensic getting getting into that mind. Well, that's, that what is. It be, that's what we do to, to our loved ones in life or whoever we're dating at the time. We are just natural born investigators. My mm -hmm. friend calls me an investigator because I like to get down. If something doesn't sound right, I ask layer by layer by layer by layer till I get to the root of it. I do that to fam. I do that to my mom and them. If I don't, it's like, why would you do that? So what made you? And what were you thinking? The third degree with Michelle Williams. I see. I, I do it all. And <laughs> before I joined Destiny's Child, I was supposed to see an autopsy. My uncle, who's our family physician, he called the local, the county coroner, and um, arranged for me to shadow her doing an autopsy. But I couldn't make it because on the day of, I was shooting the Say My Name video. So it's kind of like, what do you want to do with life? Would it say my name or autopsy? No one who has ever watched that video has thought she probably was supposed to be in an autopsy. I was supposed to be watching, you know, someone's brain pull back. And instead, and instead, I was hair getting, and makeup. I was hair and makeup and tons of extensions <laughs> being put in. <laughs> tons and tons of extensions. Tons of extensions. I would like to bring some big fans of yours from the HuffPost Live community in, and they're joining us with some questions. First up is Ronald Panzini. Hi, Ronald. Hey, how are you? I'm Hi. good. You're on with hey. Michelle. How's your day going? It's going good, honey. How about you? I'm great. Um, I got a question to ask you. Have you. Is there ever been a celebrity that you've met that you were just speechless and starstruck? Yes, absolutely. It was Whitney Houston in Los <laughs> Angeles. Uh, myself, Beyonce and Kelly, we were walking into our hotel. Bobby Brown was in the hotel lobby and he said, my wife loves you girls. She comes and starts singing Say My Name. What did you do? I, so I stayed normal. Because it, 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 it's nerve-wracking for me when someone sees me and they freak out. So I don't do that to other people. So I went to my hotel room. I got the pillow, put it up to my face, and just went into convulsions and screams of joy. Her, her the, the album of I'm Your Baby Tonight with and Miracle and all that song, that was the very first album I ever bought with my own money. So to see her, Oh my God, and for her to be killing, say my name? Just a little, oh, she killed it. I used to dance around to the I'm Your Baby Tonight album in the living room. See? You so Ronald, that is, that was my starstruck moment. Were all three of you starstruck? I mean, that had to be a moment just for well, the group in general. We for could, Whitney Houston of all We people. couldn't believe that she was singing Say My Name, and then she was just encouraging us. She said, y'all stay together, stick together love each other. She was very encouraging. I remember my very first Broadway debut of being, I, being in Aida. We invited her to come to opening night. She couldn't come. She sent flowers. So I still have a couple of those flowers. They're dried up, obviously, but I still have that and the, and the written card that it's from Whitney. What, with you in hotel lobbies, you first met Beyonce in a hotel lobby too, right? It, yes, I did in you Atlanta. You have the luck in a hotel lobby. I You're meeting know. everybody. I know. Who's next? <laughs> so you met Beyonce in a hotel lobby before you joined the group? Before I joined the group, it was Beyonce and Kelly. They were in Atlanta. They were supposed to do a gig and the promoter didn't have their money. And they were like, well, we'll just sign autographs in the hotel lobby. And because they didn't want to disappoint the people that came to see them, so they held an intimate meet and greet for some of them. And I saw them in that hotel. And how long, how much long after was it until you became part of the group? Oh, like a couple months. It was very weird. It was a couple months because the dancer who danced for Monica, who I was a background singer for at the time, she was Destiny's Child's choreographer, and I believe like Beyonce's cousin. And so they were like, well, when they were looking for new members, um, they said, well, I know a girl 
and I went to Houston and I told them that story. I said, hey, y'all remember in Atlanta, I was a girl with those twigs. I had these Bantu knots in my head. <laughs> and they're like, yes, we remember you. You were so sweet. And I was like, y'all were really sweet too. And then here we are, 14, almost 15 years later of great relationship. What was it like actually joining up? Because the two of them had already had this relationship going on, and then you you came into the group. Mm -hmm. And for fans of the group, it seemed like when you stepped on, everything clicked. It was divine. It was destiny. It really was. And coming in, I made sure I didn't want to force myself onto them because they were coming out of something that was traumatic for them. You're in a, imagine growing up with friends that you've known all your life and then it's severed. So I was sensitive to that fact, you know, but we, we, we actually got along instantly, but I, was, I wasn't trying to be best friends right away because I wanted to respect the hurt and the healing process that they had to go through when they lost two of their other best friends. I want to bring in our next guest, Michelle Boulden is here. Hi, Michelle. Hey, how you guys hey. doing? Two Michelles here. I Michelle, know. you are on with Michelle. What's up? Yes. Hey, okay, so my question for you, Michelle, is um, can you speak about how your life shifts when you honor or walk in your calling? I mean, you really went through that. You you mm -hmm. went from what you thought you wanted to do to really, really walking in your calling. When I tell you, when you walk in your calling and your purpose, it's almost like you don't care if money comes with it because what comes with walking in your purpose and your calling is peace. Mm. When you walk in your calling and purpose, success finds you. You don't have to chase it. You don't have to lose sleep over it. There's peace that comes. And it's like when you know you're walking in your calling, it's like you get all kind of testimonies from other people because you become an inspiration to other people to just do it. I'm in my own lane, I'm comfortable with what I'm doing, and um, life definitely shifts. I'm not chasing anything, it's finding me. And that's just, you know, how I live. Is that, does that speak to um, so much of what we see with a lot of celebrities these days, that they, they seem like they have it all together and then things sort of fall apart when they're, they're looking for, okay, well, I just wanted to be famous or I just wanted to be rich, so, so that's what I did versus I really love what I do. I mean, you, you love what you do, but I think what happens, some celebrities have a hard time because there's gonna come a point where you're not gonna be sought after like you were once unless you're just blessed to just year after year find something to do. I was guilty of attaching like my self-worth according to how people viewed me or was I relevant. Hmm. That's, if I wasn't on blogs every day, or I'm still balancing this, like if I'm off for like two days, I start feeling like a bum. I start feeling like I'm not contributing to society. Because it's that worth ethic of the being in the group where we were constantly, constantly working, constantly on the go. And I had to stick around and say, don't attach my self-worth according to what I'm doing today or if I'm out doing 80 interviews. I'm still a great person. Things are just slow today. But tomorrow, you're going to wish you had that nap. You could take that nap that you were able to take yesterday. So I would just encourage people not to attach their value to your career. Attach your value to who your heart posture. Attach your value to you know, how you treat people, not to what you have in the bank. You, Although it's good to have money in the bank. It's always good to have money. That's not who you, money in the bank is not who you are. Work on who you are. It seems like you've been able to do that, but while maintaining an incredible career. career. I mean, you have this wonderful solo career in addition to, in addition to the group. Talk to me about the new album. Things aren't always peaches and cream. I'm able to share with Michelle the other Michelle, I'm able to just share with her from my experience because I had the moment where my self-esteem was down in the dumps. I didn't feel good about myself. So I'm not some life guru. I'm not telling you something that I haven't experienced just to sound good and philosophical and deep. <laughs> I'm just telling you the revelations that I've had recently, you know, so.
And that's just a great balance. And if I can help other people that are going through that in their careers, whether you're a celebrity or just someone that's torn between going to school and just starting their own business, being an entrepreneur, I, I, will, I can assist you with that because I've been through it. You seem so comfortable in your own skin and so confident with who you are. And I think we hear that so much in your solo album. Was Is working um, by yourself and sort of just with you does that help you really find your voice in a way that maybe doesn't when you're working in, say, a choir or a group? Well, my new album is titled Journey to Freedom, and it was to be free from all of that stuff that is gonna keep me from thinking clearly, being confident, being free from whatever is keeping me from being my best. I had to sever toxic relationships, whether it was business-wise, personal-wise. So when you're talking about your walking in your calling, you're gonna have to get rid of some people on that journey because some people can be dead weight, you know? And so I had to get rid of some people. So that's been my journey to freedom, being free from negative thoughts. It's a daily process. I can't read comments on blogs and on things because people will tear you down and they'll make you feel Everybody's worthless about this on the computer. Because, because unfortunately, a part of you might believe what was said, you know? My shoes were ugly, they were great. Or you didn't like my interview, you didn't think I sounded good, I thought I sounded fabulous. Now some stuff is constructive, but when you're just trying to destroy my heart and be evil, that's what I have a problem with. I'm from the Midwest, so it's like I just love everybody. I want to still be, it's like that little girl in me that still wants to be liked and accepted by everybody. That's another thing about your purpose and calling. You will not be liked by everybody. So just take a chill pill and just do you. And and when you do you, you see the relationships and the people that are worth putting the time and effort into, right? I'm telling you, good things just start finding you and attaching themselves to you. Since I've been in this space, there have been so many great things that have come my way. And I'm not saying I don't have my moment where I'm just like, ooh, but nope, you're blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm good. I was inspired by Iyanla Van Zandt the other day. Um, Oprah is fixing her house. Iyanla didn't think she would be able to buy a house anymore. Stuff like that keeps me going. Stuff like that keeps me, keeps me going because miracles are still happening today. They, they might not be the mystical, biblical miracles that we people raising up from the dead that kind of be a little nervous if I saw grandma coming from the dead. What I'm saying is miracles are still happening by people being helped and nurtured. That's a miracle. Speaking of a little miracle, your friend Kelly just had a baby. Ooh, you, that was good, Kelly. Right? Good little switch there. Yeah, she just had, had a baby. Word. She had a baby, little Titan. He's so, oh, 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 sweet and cute. I love that your relationship with, with the group, because this is how we all like to picture you in our heads as yeah. friends, is that you're all still best friends. Are you going to go are. see the baby? I am, I am, I am, I am. I can't wait. First thing tomorrow. First thing tomorrow? First thing tomorrow. Oh, you're going to go see the baby. I, 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 I have to. I have to. Are you going to bring a baby gift? What do you bring him? Oh. To go shopping for cute baby clothes. There's nothing more fun than dressing a baby. Well, definitely. I mean, she had a fun baby shower, so, but of course, being auntie, you just find anything. I'd be walking at the airport and Hudson dudes and be like, you want a People magazine? Titan, you want a, you know, big random gummy bears. Mm -hmm. Even though he has no teeth. Not yet, but that's what you the know. aunties do. They pick up anything. <laughs> You're gonna, that's what parents can't spoil. That's Would what you, you like these for. shoes? I think that, I don't think they're baby no, proof. I don't know, this is like, now anything you see, I wonder could he like that. <laughs> that is precious. Michelle, I want to thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, It's been so much fun hanging out yes, with you. you too. And of course, a big thanks to other Michelle yes. and Roland from our HuffPost Live community who joined us today. And of course, don't forget, Michelle's album is available now. And Fix My Choir premieres tonight, November 5th at 10, 9 central on Oxygen. For more information on the show and Michelle and the album, everything you need is in the resource well below, so check all that out. And stick around, we have a lot more coming up on Top of the Thanks. The power